Hi, everyone. <clears throat> We're back with the Bitcoin security and privacy panel moderated by Michael Perklin, featuring Jameson Lopp, Jimmy Song, and Michael Flexman. I'll introduce Michael Perklin very briefly. He's a cryptocurrency security expert, having provided over a decade of contributions to the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency industry. He currently serves as CISO, Chief Information Security Officer of Shapeshift, and President of C4. He's also the co-author of the Cryptocurrency Security Standard. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be moderating this panel. Um, I have the pleasure of, uh, of serving this panel with uh, a few of my colleagues in this space. Uh, we have uh, Jameson Lopp, um, we have Jimmy Song, and we have Michael Flaxman. Jameson, why don't you go introduce yourself to the, to the audience? Sure. I'm CTO of CASA. We are a provider of multi-sig self-custody services. Uh, prior to that, I was also doing multi-sig self-custody at the enterprise level with BitGo and just been a general Bitcoin enthusiast for a number of years. Thank you. Uh, Michael Flaxman, um, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, I'm... Uh... I guess I can say longtime Bitcoiner now. I had my first uh, commit to PyCoin in 2013. Um, I write the 10x Bitcoin security guide on how to use multisig to secure your Bitcoin. Uh, I'm a co-maintainer of the Biddle Python Bitcoin library uh, with Jimmy Song also on this panel. Thank you, Michael. And Jimmy. I am a Bitcoin author, educator, and entrepreneur. I've written three books, Programming Bitcoin uh, from O'Reilly. Um, the Little Bitcoin Book and Thank God for Bitcoin, uh, all of which talk about Bitcoin from various aspects. I'm a longtime open source contributor to various Bitcoin projects, um, including Bitcoin Core. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, uh, for everyone in the audience, the, the panel met earlier this week to uh, discuss some topics that we would be uh, chatting about on, on stage here with you. And we've got some, some great topics that, have, uh, uh, that are going to come up. The first one that I think is um, one of the most important when you're dealing with security is that uh, there is always going to be trade-offs between every decision that you make. And, and depending on uh, what your threat model is and what your goals are, different trade-offs make more sense. Uh, Jameson, you, you brought this topic up when we were, when we were planning. Um, I'd, uh, I'd like to go to you first. What types of trade-offs do you recommend uh, people take uh, or, or, or consider when planning their security model with Bitcoin? This is one of the things where there's no one size fits all solution. And so uh, when I was working in the enterprise setting, uh, there tended to be a more uh, common set of, of threat models and issues that uh, enterprises who are dealing with uh, having to transact constantly, uh, they are worried about that from you know, having basically a target painted on their back. But I think what more people are here are going to be interested in is the individual perspective of, you know, I'm uh, trying to be my own bank and what am I trying to protect myself against. And I think that a lot of people, especially if they're spending time researching this space, you're, you're going to run into the, the crazy hardcore edge cases. People are worried about, you know, 6102 uh, style confiscation, uh, nation state level attacks or whatever. Uh, but really what I think people need to be most worried about is uh, shooting yourself in the foot. <laughs> And I think a lot of people don't put themselves into their own threat model. So that's uh, the first thing that I try to get across to people is that it's, it's not all about creating the most insane level of security, because if you manage to achieve perfect security, then you've actually locked yourself out of being able to access your own assets. So rather, um, what I, I try to get across to a lot of people is that you want uh, resilience and redundancy in addition to just going to the extreme of security at the expense of, of convenience. And, uh, and you know, that's where it, it's, it's hard to talk about uh, all of the details that go into that. Um, but, you know, this is why we're having these discussions is so that we understand that 
we need to have multiple outs. We, we need to be able to recover uh, from various uh, failure scenarios. Yeah, and he brings, uh, Jamison brings up a really good point. Security um, and convenience tend to be sort of contrasted against one another. And if you have very strict security, what you're going to get is not a lot of convenience because if you have like multi-sig spread over multiple you know, jurisdictions and so on, you're, you're, it's not going to be very convenient for you to go access that Bitcoin. So it really depends on who you are. If you are somebody that's using Bitcoin as a store of value for the long term and you don't need to access it for the next five years, yeah, by all means, go and put uh, you know, uh, keys in different <laughs> jurisdictions and have all sorts of multi-sig setups and make it very difficult for yourself to uh, access that Bitcoin so that others have a very difficult time also accessing that Bitcoin should they try to attack it. But if you're a trader, if you're somebody that needs to access your Bitcoin quite frequently, or if you're a business that needs to access cold storage on a fairly regular basis, um, that level of convenience needs to be uh, higher than having it in multiple jurisdictions in a giant multi-sig setup or something like that. So that that is the, the particular trade-off that you generally have to think about with security is that it, it does tend to come at the price of convenience. And uh, it, it's for that reason that uh, you need to think about who you are as a Bitcoin holder, like what, what you're planning to do with it and how you plan to use it. I think one of the uh, big things that's often um, uh, that I often harp on in Bitcoin is the value of multisig because it allows you to make mistakes. Um, and we think of Bitcoin as this scary thing where you're going to make one mistake and you're going to lose all your Bitcoin. There's been stories since forever about somebody throwing out a hard drive or forgetting a password and being locked out of a, a massive fortune. Um, the reality of, of where multisig is and the, in theory, what it offers are still a little bit of a gap. It's still not as easy to use as, as I would like it to be for everyone. But in theory, multisig is this amazing win uh, because you're allowed to make horrible mistakes. And you know, depending on your threshold, like in a three of five example, you could make two horrific mistakes. And as long as you have access to three hardware wallets, you'd still be able to spend your funds. Um, so having that that um, no single point of failure in multisig is a really, really good thing. The, I think the biggest vulnerability is just in practice, there's a lot of difficult details, getting the hardware wallets to play nicely with one another, having to run your own node, um, even the way you verify, like, are my other hardware wallets part of this multisig quorum is all kind of complicated now, and it is getting easier all the time. Um, so I think the biggest vulnerabilities are um, these detail things that, that are there still room to get wrong? Um, but the thing that's important to remember is that Bitcoin is actually the most securable asset in human history, and that that's a new thing. You cannot two of three or three of five year gold. Um, only Bitcoin can offer this. And I, and I would argue that uh, no altcoin can either. I mean, we've seen um, Ethereum have a massive loss in the parity multi-sig contract. Um, and that's sort of something to be expected when you have um, a complex smart contracting language and not a simple a statically analyzable smart contracting language like Bitcoin has. So um, multi-sig provides this uh, un unbelievable level of security that's never existed in the world, um, but it's just a little bit complicated right now. And this, uh, this these types can... of trade-offs, so... oh, go ahead, Jameson. I was just going to say, this can also be really overwhelming. Uh, you know, the, the three of us are probably going to be talking about some crazy low-level details that, you know, we understand because we live and breathe this stuff. But I, I can imagine that you know most people who are in the audience, uh, people who are just dipping their toes into this, they start hearing security experts talk about how to do like the extreme perfect uh, security setup, and they're just going to feel totally overwhelmed. And I think one of my biggest fears is that 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 will turn people off from even trying to move into self-custody. You know, I don't want people to feel like, well, this is so complicated that I might as well just leave all my money on the exchange. Yeah, there, there's always going to be a trade-off when, when dealing with these things. And, and while we're talking about some of the, the specific technical aspects of it, um, generally speaking, when, when you look at the information theory of security, uh, Jimmy mentioned there, there was uh, that, uh, that trade-off. It, it's a, it's a three-point trade-off between confidentiality, integrity, and availability. If you maximize confidentiality, the, the secretness of your key, 
you're going to minimize either the availability of that uh, of that key or the integrity of it or both. Similarly, if you make it incredibly available, because now you've copied it into five or ten places across multiple uh, multiple places, sure, it's more available, but now you're compromising the confidentiality of your key. It's these trade-offs that um, that you you have to make in general, and and once you've you've decided on that model, then you go into the specifics of multi-sig or or, or, or or something else. I'm a firm believer that um, just like today, everyone has very good or j people have, have better, I should say people have better password hygiene today in 2021 compared to the 1980s and, and 1990s when, when computing um, first started taking the world by storm. Um, you know, it took 20 years for us to become comfortable with passwords and know the pitfalls of reusing passwords and um, not using uh, proper character sets in your passwords and things like that. It's my belief that 20 years from now, everyone will be so f comfortable with private key security just as they are today with uh, with password security sure there will still be some people who are doing it wrong maybe reusing a key in, in multiple places but uh, uh the the children that are growing up today will will grow up in a private key controlled world and i think that's that's really exciting Um, next, I'd like to talk a little bit about something that's being built on uh, Bitcoin that is uh, giving a lot of benefits to, to Bitcoin users, and that is Lightning. Um, with Lightning, there are a lot of uh, great benefits to uh, Bitcoiners, uh, what with also its own trade-offs. Again, you, you have that tug of war between the, uh, the different aspects that, that you optimize for. Um, we we were talking before this uh, this panel about some of the trade-offs between Lightning security and usability. Um, Jimmy, why don't you start us off with uh, Lightning security and usability? Well, Lightning is extremely convenient in the sense that you can uh, you don't need any confirmations on the on chain or whatever, um, and you know you can you can send extremely small amounts uh, for you know very low fees and so on. Um, if you've uh, tried something like Sphinx Chat uh, or the Breeze podcasting app or whatever, you 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 know exactly how quickly you can you can do that stuff. Um, the only problem uh, with Lightning is is sort of that security model. Um, you have to have your node online as you're spending, and that uh, and if you're a routing node, you need your private keys online the entire duration that you're routing because you can't route anything without your private key. So uh, the security model is significantly different than one of Bitcoin, where you could keep your private key offline and so on. There, there's not really much choice but to keep it online at least some of the time. And that, that of course, does expose it to the internet and so on. Um, I, I think there are ways to maybe once in a while, like, um, you know, uh, if you have like a fat channel open with an exchange or something like that, and uh, you could keep the key offline and sign just the, um, the funding transactions or something to that effect. Um, but that said, it's, uh, it generally tends to be harder to secure, but it is extremely convenient. For, so for small amounts of money uh, and for you know, microtransactions, uh, I, I think Lightning makes all the sense in the world. Um, and from a security perspective, I would say that it, it's, um, it enables uh, something like a decentralized web uh, that we've all been wanting. Instead of keeping uh, you know, your passwords on a centralized website like Facebook or Twitter or whatever, um, you can have things like Sphinx Chat, which are completely peer-to-peer, -peer, and you don't uh, store any of your credentials anywhere and so on. So uh, from that perspective, I think Lightning is uh, an order of magnitude improvement over sort of like the current uh, web as it is structured. So it, it's going in the right direction. But that said, it's uh, from a monetary perspective and versus Bitcoin on chain, it, it, it really is sort of like more vulnerable, though. You know, like we we haven't yet seen too many people like get hacked on that necessarily, but it, it is uh, it, it is more risk. Jameson, do you have anything to add? Um, you know, this is, I would say, at a point where I'm I'm actually kind of pleasantly surprised that there haven't been more disasters uh, with lightning. Um, I think I wrote 
a fairly lengthy post six or seven years ago where I outlined a few different potential disaster scenarios of uh, essentially like network collapse or economic issues that could happen. And, um, you know, while Lightning does have its share of issues around like potential economic attacks or privacy uh, attacks that have been sort of spoken about academically, uh, I don't think that we've seen too much that has actually been carried out. Um, so, you know, that this, this whole thing, of course, is uh, an interesting ongoing experiment because there has never really been a, a financial network constructed in this way before. So um, it's, to me, it's still something fascinating to continue to watch and evolve. And um, I'm hopeful that someday I will feel confident enough to participate uh, from a large economic standpoint. Um, you know, basically doing my own type of, of yield farming, as it were, uh, liquidity providing on the Lightning Network. Um, uh, I have seen uphand just for running a routing node. It, if you're going to do it with large amounts of money, you really need to be almost like at the enterprise level of like IT infrastructure provider, um, simply because there are a number of different single points of failure, things that can cause you to have funds loss that are all a direct result of what Jimmy said of the fact that you have to have these keys online, you have to have um, these other databases that are constantly being uh, written to. And if you lose that data, uh, you may or may not be able to go into certain manual recovery scenarios. And uh, it can get pretty gnarly. Um, as I actually wrote a, a blog post about a couple uh, months ago of a number of different uh, nasty data and funds recovery scenarios that I've run into over the years. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. The um, uh, with, with traditional Bitcoin, the only thing that you really need to worry about backing up is your key. And whether you choose to keep that key offline or online, you can receive coins, you can then you can uh, participate in the Bitcoin network with lightning. Um, uh, with the extra convenience of micropayments and uh, nothing being written to chain, while you have all those benefits, um, what, you, what you bring up, Jameson, is absolutely true. There's more than just the key that you need to back up um, with, with the, the, the constant state that is ever changing. Um, and uh, while it may be uh, accessible to people who have uh, uh, significant amounts of, uh, of money to open up a variety of channels with other participants, not everybody is able to open up a Lightning channel. Um, what, uh, what, one one uh, other difference between Lightning and, and Bitcoin is the requirement to put up your own capital into a channel. For example, opening a channel worth $100 uh, between myself and Jameson, allowing me to participate in the in the Lightning network and all the other uh, connections that Jameson may have beyond, beyond his note. If I don't have that $100 to open up a channel, I, I, I can't participate in, in the network to, to receive my 0.05 uh, uh, micropayment. Now, of course, you don't have to put up 100 uh, Bitcoin in a channel. You can put up less, um, but there is still a higher barrier of entry than, than what uh, traditional Bitcoin offers, where as long as you have a key, you don't need any capital to receive your funds and, and keep it secure offline. What, is that is that true? Because I, I I don't think you need any funds in order to have a channel open to you. So you can have a one way channel where somebody opens a hundred dollars, you know, worth uh, worth of Bitcoin into into you, and then you you can receive as much as that channel capacity allows. If I'm not mistaken, uh, it doesn't have to be bi directional. So there's you know there's. There's the like I think there's the theory and then there's the reality and that um, I think that one of the more interesting challenges going forward here is going to be less on the technical side and more on the economic side of how do we how do we push a lot of the complexities of figuring out liquidity under the hood like uh, my personal belief is that. I don't think that Lightning Network is going to be a, a mainstream thing until we can get away, abstract away a lot of the fact of that, the, that there are channels even happening under the hood, right? Like channel management is not something that we will, 
would want the average person to have to even think about. And so, uh, you know, one of the main uh, things that I think is important there is to get more and more liquidity providers onto the Lightning Network and then figure out ways to, to make these integrations more seamless. Uh, you know, you should be able to basically have an exchange provide liquidity since they already have a lot of funds. Um, th this is where also I think the um, Lightning pool uh, technology that they're working on is going to come into play. I know that, you know, there's active uh, outreach happening from uh, Lightning Labs to, to figure out, you know, how do, we, how do we bring together the people who have the liquidity uh, with the people who want the liquidity and figure out the best way to build the technology to make that happen. Awesome. Um, the, the, you're absolutely right, Jameson, that uh, uh, today um, programs are still working on the plumbing that everyone will be using tomorrow. I, I, I compare it in my mind to uh, the engineers who worked on TCP IP and then HTTP that was built on top of it. And now today we are able to grab our tablet and have a video call with, uh, with grandma on the other side of the planet so easily that you're not even thinking about you know, uh, HTTP connections and TCP channels. Uh, I, I look forward to the, the user interfaces that will be built on top of these technical primitives to make Bitcoin super easy to use in the future for, for everyone who comes after us. Let's put this um, technical stuff, stuff aside. Uh, I, I, I know that, uh, that in, in our audience, while we do have some very technical people, we also have some fairly uh, untechnical people. Bitcoin can be used by anybody. Uh, I'd like to ask the panelists, um, if you had to share just one or, or maybe uh, two maximum um, suggestions for improving people's Bitcoin security or privacy, what would your suggestions be? Uh, I'll, I'll get us started. Um, I think what, one of the, the easiest things that somebody can do to improve their security um, is actually a unicorn in the security world. Um, usually, whenever you add security to something, you're going to be making it a little bit more complicated. For example, uh, we all have seen 2FA. Um, in addition to uh, entering your username and your password, now you have to enter in a six-digit code that you get from somewhere. That does make your account more secure, but it also makes it a little bit more annoying for you because now there's that third thing that you have to be uh, uh, typing in. Um, one unicorn in the security industry is password managers. A password manager can improve your security hygiene by making it very easy to create long, unique passwords for every uh, in, in individual site that, that are never reused and also make it easier for you to log in because now instead of typing a very long password that, that you have memorized, which you could forget or, uh, or, or could make a typo, with a single click, your password manager will copy and paste the password into the, the login box, regardless of whether your password is five characters long or 128 characters long. So uh, simply adopting the use of a password manager in your personal life will dramatically improve the security that you have on all the sites that you connect. That's my number one uh, security tip for, for anyone um, looking to, uh, to improve their, their operational security. Um, Michael Flaxman, do, do you have any tips that you would recommend to any um, the, uh, any new people in the, in the space? Yeah, a similar one to password manager is U2F keys. Um, so this is a little physical piece of hardware. It kind of looks like a Bitcoin hardware wallet, but it it's not for storing Bitcoin. It's just for authenticating you when you log into trusted services, which could be an exchange where you're buying Bitcoin. That's a great example, one you're holding up right now. Um, it could be a hosted service like Google or Dropbox or Twitter or Facebook. And it's a really easy to use thing. When you go to log in, it asks you this extra challenge. It says, put in your U2F key and hit the button on there. Um, most of them don't even have screens or anything. It's like literally just hit the button, but it means that for somebody to steal your U2F key um, for access to your site, they would have to physically like come into your home and take it, um, which is enormously more uh, tricky than say like guessing your weak password, for example. Um, so U2F keys are great. Once you have them, you just add them to every service you use. Uh, it's amazing. Like even login.gov for like, um, you know, if you use any services there takes a 2FA key uh, or sorry, a U2F key. And once you have them, you may even want to get multiple, but you don't have to start that way. Um, so, you know, like I keep one in a safe deposit box and I keep one at home and I keep one in my travel bag. And so I can always just, um, 
have that access should like everything else melt down. Um, so U2F keys are great. You can get them. Um, Google sells one, a Titan key that's highly reputable for $25. You can buy different ones on Amazon for $20. Um, so that's a great way to help you with authentication, which is a different problem than storing Bitcoin. Um, but you're probably going to buy Bitcoin somewhere and they should support U2F keys. And so you should secure your account that way. And it just requires no tech know-how. You'll just figure it out. It's really easy to use. That's right. Um, as much as attackers can remotely connect to your computer, they cannot do touch over IP, at least not yet. Uh, Jimmy, do you have anything to add? Well, what would you recommend to people looking to secure their um, their account? Well, uh, the the first thing, um, and I, I've run Twitter polls on my Twitter account, and uh, the the thing that uh, still shocks me is that a vast majority of people just still keep their bitcoins on an exchange, and this has traditionally been the biggest. Uh, you know, security hole for most Bitcoin holders. The the biggest, uh, you know, fail in uh, Bitcoin history was Mt. Gox when they went bankrupt. And uh, there's a lot of people that would have a lot more money if they simply kept their own Bitcoins instead of leaving it on Mt. Gox, for example. So um, getting it off the exchange and, you know, getting into you know, hardware wallets or self custody of some uh, way, shape, or form. That that I think is the first step. Now that tends to be very scary for a lot of people because we're not used to bare instruments or uh, things that we have to secure on our own, and it does require some level of technical understanding. But I, I think that's the main step that most people can take. Um, we haven't had a major exchange like go down as a result of a hack in a while, but I. I think it's kind of inevitable, whether through internal hacking, external hacking, um, you know, rehypothecation or just, uh, you know, bad loans or something like that. Like there, there's, it's inevitable and it will happen. Um, I, I think a, a lot of people have been sort of conditioned over the last uh, three or four years to think that, you know, nothing bad's going to happen and I could keep it on this thing for five years or something like that. Um, I, I generally don't think that's a very good bet, and it's a it's a very big risk to your Bitcoin if you're keeping all your coins on an exchange. We've actually seen uh, a, a number of exchanges still getting hacked. Like the the total number of exchanges getting hacked is going up, but I think that they are newer and smaller exchanges. And if I recall correctly from the stats that I ran uh, at the end of the year, it's like fewer Bitcoin are being stolen, and it's more altcoins that are being stolen in large quantities. And it's probably just because new people, new companies coming into these spaces, not knowing any of the best practices and basically repeating them, the mistakes of the past. But um, in terms of general security, um, if I was going to talk just to a, a regular person, um, I would actually advocate minimalism. And, and by minimal, minimalism, what I mean is stop installing every little piece of software you come across, stop adding a million different browser extensions to your browser for convenience, uh, especially uh, stop, stop downloading and installing every little crypto price ticker or crypto whatever thing, um, because you're exposing yourself to a higher likelihood of malware. And uh, the the sort of real world reason that I say this is that we've had a number of clients come to us at Casa and we've been walking them through you know, setting up a multi-sig wallet and, and they'll have like never had a uh, treasure before. And this has happened multiple times. I've seen it. They go to plug in their treasure for the first time and it automatically pops up uh, uh, a web page that uh, is actually a fake Trezor malware page and is asking them to put their seed phrase into it. And they're like, is this normal? You know, should I be doing this? And we'd be like, no, stop everything, burn your computer, go buy a new computer. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there who probably have, you know, crypto specific malware that's already on your computer. It's just laying in wait for you to try to do something so that they can, you know, try to trick you into getting your private keys. Yeah, that, that's a great point. There are so many copycat apps out there that uh, impersonate the Trezor app or impersonate the Keep Key app or, or whatever um, crypto app that uh, people use. And um, usually the dead giveaway is it's asking for your seed phrase. Uh, for those in the audience who, who aren't aware, most Bitcoin um, uh, clients 
uh, it either generates or asks you to enter a, um, a mnemonic sentence. This is uh, 12 or 24 words that uh, create all of your private keys. It's only ever needed the first time you set up that, uh, that Bitcoin client, and it's never needed again. Um, one telltale sign that you've got malware is whenever you're opening up your Bitcoin program, it's asking you for that, that seed phrase um, when you've already set up that treasure or you've already set up that, uh, that ledger wallet. Um, making sure that you're using the real apps from the real publishers is absolutely important. And, and once you have those apps, you're, you're able to send and receive Bitcoin on chain. But there's, um, but there, there's another aspect of, uh, of security that, that we haven't touched on yet on the panel, and that is privacy. With a public ledger for everyone in the world to write to and to read from, anybody can see where any amount of Bitcoins are, are transferring. Now, sure, at first you see one Bitcoin address to another Bitcoin address, and you may not be able to immediately tell uh, who is controlling address one or address two. But um, once you know that, that, uh, that you've received some funds from Michael Perklin, um, you can ask him, well, wh where did he get those funds from? And you can start to peel apart the history of, uh, of all these transactions and, and get a, a, a real world picture of how much wealth people may have on, on, online. What strategies are there to minimize your, your, um, your data footprint or, or to maximize your privacy when using public blockchains like, like Bitcoins? Uh, do any of you have suggestions? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so the, uh, what I like to say about Bitcoin is that it's as private as you want it to be and the default setting is not very private. Um, so by default, it is hard to get privacy right in Bitcoin. You're probably buying your coins on an exchange. That exchange is, is asking you for KYC information, like your driver's license and social security or utility bill. So they know who you are. They're probably record sharing um, with um, blockchain analysis companies like Chainalysis that are basically spying on behalf of the government and doing that with all the other exchanges. So um, you know, if, if you send Bitcoins to somebody and they withdraw them at an exchange, then they'll probably be able to figure that out too. Um, and then of course, how you're using that service. So if, or how you're storing those coins. So if you're using like a hardware wallet that shares the XPubs with a server somewhere, it's sharing, here's my collection of addresses, um, then you've also doxed yourself there. So privacy is, is hard. You, you need to buy your coins anonymously. You need to run your own node so that you're not querying third-party services. Uh, now, maybe you could argue like Electrum behind Tor would be sufficient, but there are trade-offs there and that's, that's non-trivial as well. Um, so unfortunately, the privacy story in Bitcoin is hard, but it's actually not nearly as bad as it sounds because um, number one, the fact that Bitcoin doesn't rely on any zero knowledge proofs or anything like that um, means that it's very easy to audit the supply, which is um, what I think and what many Bitcoiners think is by far the most important thing in Bitcoin. We can all uh, trivially verify the 21 million Bitcoin supply cap on the most basic of hardware. That guarantee is always true. And that's what gives us the confidence in the monetary policy. So I actually think that that's a feature, not a bug. And the second part of it is that as much as it might be uncomfortable for people to know how much uh, Bitcoin you have or to see your Bitcoin transactions, um, fundamentally, privacy and security are different things. Now, if it's known that you have a lot of Bitcoin, you've just painted a target on your back. That's not ideal. Uh, that said, you know the richest people in the world, um, at least we don't hear about it, don't, don't tend to be getting robbed. Um, and the real reality of it is that all assets are liquid on a long enough time horizon you won't see a Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk vacationing in Venezuela um, because that would be very dangerous, but there are not like kidnap and ransom operations in the US um, because it would be so hard to rob somebody in this way. You would need so much support. Uh, you would literally need to hold somebody hostage for days, potentially weeks. Any person who was involved in that in any way would go to jail for a very long time if they were caught. Um, and so in practice, it's an uncomfortable topic, um, but it's not that different from a rich person who's CEO of a company or who's known to own a lot of property. All assets are liquid on a long enough time horizon. Bitcoin is just unique in that with a gun held to your head in a single key setup where you have the hardware wallet in front of you, you can just hit send and move it. Um, but in practice, most people keep their coins in a more secure setup anyway, where you know, uh, you'd know you have to go into like a safe deposit box at a bank to get them out. And they're only open um, you know, Monday to Friday during bank hours and they have 
silent alarms and you have to show ID and sign and all that. So um, it's a scary, uncomfortable thing, but I don't think wealth is a new topic and I don't think Bitcoin fundamentally changes that. Yeah, it is. It is a threat model issue. Uh, you know, this is also one of my side projects is whenever I hear about a physical attack uh, that is against uh, someone who is being targeted because they have Bitcoin, I put that on my, my GitHub project for it. And I think there have only been 60 something in the decade plus uh, of history that we're aware of. And uh, close to the majority of them, I think, are people who are engaging in high risk behavior, aka doing face to face high value Bitcoin trades with people that they don't know. Uh, so there was actually one just a few weeks ago, you know, some guy uh, in Germany met some other random guy in a parking lot and uh, ended up you know, getting his uh, wallet physically snatched out of his hand when he unlocked it. So, um, yeah, you know, privacy like security is a very complicated topic. And it's really a question of what are you trying to be private from? Uh, and so usually once again, when, when experts come together to talk about this type of stuff, it's usually the crazy insane edge case of, well, you know, how do we remain a hundred percent private from, you know, nation state level surveillance? You know, what are all of the tools at our disposal for that? And, and while that is certainly theoretically possible, uh, I think it's out of reach for most of the non-technical people who aren't uh, immersed in this stuff um, around the clock because it is uh, it's a very brittle type of environment to be living in. You, you make one single mistake and that can haunt you for the rest of your life. Uh, and we've seen this time and time again um, when, when you look at usually like court case related things of, you know, how did the investigators end up tracking down this person? It was usually because of one stupid thing they did years ago that unfortunately, because the internet does not forget, uh, they were never able to get away from. Yeah, I would say that, um, with respect to privacy, I, uh, this is probably an unpopular opinion, uh, but I, I think it's uh, the risks of uh, privacy loss are a little bit overrated. Like uh, a lot of people tend to overestimate how much uh, privacy loss can be used against you um, and not enough on just general, you know, common sense security, like securing your own keys and not keeping it on an exchange and so on. Um, you know, a privacy uh, hole is a security hole. And I, I agree with that. Uh, but it's not as big of a security hole as you might think. Um, that said, you know, if you can get privacy, um, you know, all the much better. But, uh, you know, like to, to some degree, I, there's... Um, you know, it, it's it's overstated the the amount of data that you need to gather in order to really uh, dox people and and the scale at which you need to do it, it it's it usually doesn't come out to be economically viable for your attacker. So yeah, that that's the, just my personal. The opinion. one thing that I'll say about uh, I think one of the most popular privacy preserving technologies, you know, coin join in Bitcoin. There are certainly uh, some people who love CoinJoin. They talk about it all the time. Um, I've I've experimented with the various CoinJoin uh, providers. Um, you know, I tried being a market maker uh, on Join Market for a while to see what the like liquidity uh, provider yield was that I could get for that. Really. Uh, ended up barely breaking even on there and ended up not doing it uh, for the long term because um, I was making another trade off where I was having to keep those private keys online in order to provide that liquidity for, for join market. I think a lot of people kind of gloss over that security versus privacy trade off with coin join. And in general, I don't think it makes a ton of sense to be constantly coin joining uh, from a or like real world usability standpoint, if, if I want to make a private transaction, then I'll send the money through a mixer and then you know, make the payment directly after that, rather than trying to keep some pool of constantly mixed funds uh, going on. Because you run into all of these other UTXO uh, management issues if, if you're constantly trying to deal with your, like, your, your privacy UTXOs. Great points to add, Jameson, thank you. 
at this point, with with only ten and a half minutes left until the top of the hour, I'd, I'd like to turn to audience questions. Uh, we've got one question from an audience member. What happens with Bitcoin network security when the hash rate drops abruptly? Does the network become more suitable to a 51% attack? I think this is a great question. Uh, I'll, I'll start us off um, by, by mentioning that uh, Bitcoin adjusts its difficulty level every 2016 blocks. Now, normally uh, with an average of 10 minutes between blocks, uh, 2016 blocks should take about two weeks. However, if the hash rate drops abruptly, it may take a long time until the, the last of those 2016 blocks are mined, allowing the network to adjust the difficulty downward. Um, until that happens, there's, uh, there's no increased risk of a 51% attack. But after that happens, the lower the, ha the global hash rate is, the easier it is for a motivated attacker to get 51% of it by running their own miners in a, in a data center or, uh, at, or worse, by infecting en enough malware uh, in enough machines around the world that, that they can control that, that, hash, that, that hash rate. So um, at first, no, there's no, um, there's no uh, increase, but eventually there may be. Do any other panelists want to add to this uh, answer about the hash rate? We haven't really seen any huge uh, abrupt hash rate fluctuations that I can think of. I think difficulty adjustments tend to be less than 10%, uh, at least in the past few years. Um, the one, one scenario that might cause this, it would once again be a sort of nation state uh, issue is um, if, for example, like China tried to somehow ratchet down their great firewall and cut all of the miners in China off, that could be an interesting uh, split scenario. But it's unlikely that something like that would be able to persist because you only have to punch one hole through. And, and the data required for Bitcoin is so minimal. I mean, you can bounce it off the ionosphere. Uh, it's it's really hard for even uh, a first world nation to be able to prevent the flow of information like that. So, you know, I, I think it would require something even more uh, resource intensive and, and onerous. Uh, some of these edge cases that people talk about of like, well, what if, you know, China sent in uh, their army to all of the, the mining farms and tried to nationalize them all, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it gets into some interesting game theory scenarios, but I think the fact that we haven't seen anything like that happen uh, makes it seem less and less likely that it's going to, but you never know. I mean, these things are interesting to talk about. Uh, they're hard to put like a, or a quantify an actual risk percentage on. It's important to keep in mind when we think about the threat of a 51% attack that there's there's two models you can think about it in. One is like a nation state trying to cripple Bitcoin. And there's been tons of talk about this and it would be very expensive and, and difficult to pull off stealthily. Um, and in some ways it could drive prices up for Bitcoin in, while they're trying to secure mining equipment. Um, so uh, that's one topic that's been very well covered. And the other one is, is it a 51% attack against you? Like as an exchange uh, trying to trick you into depositing your Bitcoin um, uh, and or sending you Bitcoin in exchange for something else and then double spending you. And like, this is just not a, a credible threat. And no one is gonna um, you know, show up and buy your car and send you Bitcoin and double spend you. Obviously you wanna wait the number of confirmations um, that would make that transaction uh, considered safe enough. But uh, there is nobody amassing giant hash power to like steal a, a Honda Civic in a Bitcoin transaction. So I think a lot of times- No, we know like, of. <laughs> yeah, it, it would be like just just wildly out of line with the cost benefit of that attack. So, um, you know, it's it's a thing that we need to be mindful of, but it's basically the nation state version and it's very expensive to pull off and you have to sustain it for a very long time. Um, I think the biggest issue of a hash power drop is that that two week recalculation is every 2016 blocks, which should be two weeks on average. The problem is, is if hash power fell off a cliff for some reason, um, you know, maybe I'm trying to think of what that scenario would be like blackouts in all of China for a week or something, and they just couldn't run anything, including mining equipment. I mean, it'd have to be something crazy. Um, 
if that happened, that two week adjustment would actually take much longer because it's 2016 blocks and it could take a long time to find them. So then you could get a ton of fee pressure in that short period of time. Fees might shoot through the roof and it would be total chaos as people scrambled to get their transactions confirmed until that difficulty adjustment in the case of say losing half the hash power, it might take four weeks instead of two weeks. So, um, you know, it would be unpleasant, but it, it, it wouldn't really do anything. Great. I have to Our interject in the interest of time. Uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, thoughts and inputs on our audience's questions. Thank you, Michael, Michael, Jameson, and Jimmy for uh, the engaging debate this morning. Uh, we are now entering our first uh, break of the day for 15 minutes. Before everybody gets up for a cup of coffee or to stretch their legs, I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that we do have uh, uh, we do have online networking uh, in the GatherTown multiverse. We fixed the link below the stream in case uh, anybody wants to join. They can find Expo committee members, speakers, sponsors to come and watch it. You can see here I'm actually in a watch party. Ooh, uh, I'm actually in a in in a watch party of the uh, expo. Uh, also, we have our Discord, which is also linked below, where you can just uh, find help about the hackathon, find help from expo committee members. Uh, and finally, we also are running a merch store this year, also linked below. Uh, so I hope you guys uh, enjoy it.